It is such a privilege to be with you. We are so glad that you have decided to give us a little bit of your weekend. We're so glad that you're joining us, whether you are joining us online or in person. Um, I don't know where you are on your journey of faith. I don't know where you are in your life, but I believe with all of my heart today that uh, today's message is gonna add value to your life. Dare I say your relationships. Uh, as Andy said, my name is Ryan, and there's a, a couple things you need to know about me. Number one, I am from the great country of Texas. Please don't boo, okay? Uh, here visiting friend uh, of Saddleback Church. The second thing that you need to know about me is that I'm married. This is a picture of my wife. Now, when people see a picture of my wife, they think to themselves, how in the world did he get her? Let me explain. Uh, when my wife and I were dating, I overheard her tell a friend that she thought it would be cool to get engaged and married on the same day. I had absolutely no idea what that meant, so I guessed and began planning our wedding behind her back over the course of two years. I was in 11 weddings before I was ever in my own. Apparently, I was a good friend in college because people I barely knew kept asking me to be in their wedding. Nevertheless, I would bring my girlfriend to each wedding and I would take copious notes on everything that she liked and didn't like about each wedding. On the 11th wedding, which was three weeks before this planned engagement, uh, the groom walks up to me and says, hey, I hear you're doing a surprise wedding. I said, keep your voice down, it's a surprise. He said, hey, uh, whatever you do, don't mess up the cake. I said, man, it's just cake, ain't that big of a deal. He said, it's a big deal, trust me, I learned my lesson the hard way. So I go over to my girlfriend at the time, I say, hey, Amanda, what do you, uh, what do you think about this cake? She goes, ah, it's all right, I got a better one on Pinterest. I didn't know what Pinterest was, so I go to Pinterest, type in my girlfriend's name, and a board pops up entitled My Dream Wedding, and it had 242 photos of everything she would want in a wedding. And I thought to myself, this would have been helpful two years ago. <laughs> Nevertheless, June 7th, 2013, I get down on one knee. I say, Amanda, will you marry me? She said, yes. I said, just kidding, will you marry me today? And we opened up a lounge room door, and about 85 of our family and friends were standing in there with the sign that said, today, we rolled in a dress, hairstylist, makeup artist, everything that you would need to be engaged and married on the same day. We were engaged for a real long time, a solid 11 hours. We filmed the whole thing. It's called The Surprise Wedding. You can check that out on YouTube later. Uh, we immediately began the baby making process, started a family. We've got a couple of kiddos. Here is a beautiful picture of my family. Uh, I've got an eight-year-old named Jackson and a four-year-old named Roman. Now, I have a pretty fun career where uh, I get to spend uh, a lot of time in ministry and a lot of time in business. Uh, some people call me a pastorpreneur. We made that up. Nevertheless, I get to spend about 80% of my work time uh, speaking all across corporate America and 20% of my work time teaching God's Word on the weekends. Now, here's what I've learned. Spending a great deal of time with people who aren't Christians and a great deal of time with people who are. Uh, it's interesting. You can actually live your life going in a direction where you attain so many things in life, except you can be lacking the one thing that sometimes matters the most, which is actually having somebody in your life that you can truly call friend. I've met a lot of people who everyone knows their name, but nobody knows their pain. They have so many things that other people want, except they don't have really great friendships. And the older we get, the harder it is to forge new friendships. Uh, sometimes coming to church can feel like walking into a grade school lunchroom for the first time, trying to figure out where do I fit in? Are these people dressed like me? They have on a weird t-shirt. I'm not sure if I belong here. Is there going to be somebody that would dare wave me down and say, you can sit with me and you and I can be friends? That's why I'm so glad we've been in this message series entitled The Lost Art of Friendship because it's hard. And I love what Pastor Andy said in week one where he talks about forming friendships like 
Jesus. He used a phrase that really stuck out to me. He said this. He said, the difference between friendship and connection is intentionality. Oh, I love that. I mean, he emphasized this idea of what it looks like for you and for me to make the decision to step towards someone like Jesus. In week two, we looked at seeing friendships like an investment. Now, with every friendship that you and I have, it is amazing the fruit that comes from investing wisdom into our most important relationships. And then last week, uh, my man Reward talked about the importance of enlarging our circle of friends and how beautiful it is to have people in our circle that don't always see the world the way that we do. Today, I want to talk to you about the importance of having honest friendships. Honest friendships. Now, here's what I know about you and what I know about me. We all need a truth teller. We all need a truth teller. Christian or not, we all need somebody in our life that has honesty as one of their core values. Today, I believe that people, you know, they have different definitions of what it means to be a good friend. Now, most people live with the expectation that for us to be good friends, you have to get my back no matter what. I need you to be ride or die. Ride or die die. I ain't got no problem riding. I got a big problem dying, okay? Like, why is this the expectation? Why do we got to die? Can't we live? Can't we ride and go to the movies and make it home safe? I heard someone say one time, I, I, I want you to be the kind of friend that would be on my side in a bar fight. And I just thought to myself, but why are you at a bar fighting? Why is that the scenery? Why can't we be at the gym playing pickleball? Why can't we be at Chipotle eating a burrito? Like, why do we have to be in this scenery throwing chairs at other human beings in a bar? Now, I'm all for loyalty, but sometimes the unspoken friendship expectation gives the idea that it's my job as a friend to support you, no matter how immoral, dangerous, or illegal your decision is. It is my job to love you, not my job to spend a prison cell of years with you, okay? I ain't got to share a prison cell with you. Like, my best friend is not ride or die. He's not ride or die because, you want to know why? He's a lawyer. If I go to jail, somebody got to get me out. That's him, okay? He is not sharing a cell with me. So I have no issue with that at all. Here's the deal. You and I have all sorts of rules for our friendships. I'm going to encourage us to adopt one this weekend that I think could absolutely change your life. Imagine if you and I decided to look our friends in the eyes and say, hey, I do have an expectation for you. And my expectation for you is this. I need you to always tell me the truth. Don't lie to me. I, I need you to be a, a truth teller. I, I love what Proverbs 27 verse 6 says. It says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Can I encourage you this weekend? You can handle the truth. I cannot guarantee you that it won't be hurtful. But I do believe it can be helpful because the reality is when it comes to having honest friendships, most people wouldn't say they have deceitful ones. Like nobody's like, yeah, my friends are liars. Nobody says that. But if we're all really honest, we've all lied to a friend and I can prove it. Have you ever been asked what you think about a friend's dating decision? So what do you think? Aren't they amazing? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're delightful. They're terrible, okay? And I can prove that too. 
we're the most honest with our friends right after a breakup. See, I ain't like them no way. I don't know why you was with them. They breath stank. I can't believe you would be spending time with somebody like that. They are start singing Taylor Swift. We are never, ever, ever getting back together. And then guess what? They get back together. And now, now you got to hold me to what I said about them when y'all was on a breakup and now you engaged. Now I'm at your wedding like, congratulations. <laughs> Here's what I would love to do today. And I know it's hard. But I want to cast a vision of what honest friendships can really look like. Because I believe you and I desperately need these. I believe that you and I Desperately need honest friendships, number one, where we can all be called on. I think we all need honest friendships where we can all be called on. I'm talking about two-way street honest friendships today, where we can call on one another and use a word that is ridiculously difficult for you and I to use, especially in church. And that's the word, help. That's a really tough word when you've got your church armor on. When you've got your church smile on. There is this unspoken rule when people often walk through the doors of a church that they should have all of their stuff together. And what's, what's the normal candor between us? It's common courtesy, right? How you doing? Good. How's the wife? Good. How the kids? Pretty good. How's work? It's all right, but mostly good. What do you do when you're not good? Can you imagine if everyone told you how they were really doing? Imagine if when we said, hey, turn and greet your neighbor, you're like, hey, how you doing? Terrible, about to get a divorce, file bankruptcy. What about you? You'd be like, oh man, my, I, didn't, I didn't know that we were actually gonna be honest today. It's kinda, and it can put us in somewhat of an odd position, but here's the deal, it's not that we don't care. It's that most of the time we, don't have the time to care because you and I are the kings and queens of drive-by check-ins. How you doing? You good? Hey man, it's good to see you. Okay, all right. Like, we're checking in with each other on the fly. We do this with neighbors. You be mowing the line. Yeah, hey, you good? All right, yeah, it's good. I mean, we're checking in with each other on the move in a parking lot. I'm, I'm asking you how you're doing because I'm being common. I'm trying to be polite. I, I just want us to take our cues from the scripture. I just, I saw this this weekend and I just thought, man, imagine if we could do this. And it's found in Philippians chapter two, starting in verse 19. It says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church of Philippi, describes Timothy as someone he knew would show genuine concern for other people. How many people do you have in your friendship circle that you could describe as that, as showing genuine concern. And I gotta be honest, I've been really convicted by this lately because I believe, in general, I'm a nice guy, but I'm not always intentionally caring. And sometimes I am just moving at such a fast pace that I don't pause long enough to look someone in the eyes and convince them that I have genuine concern about how they're actually doing. Now, there's a guy I'm in a group chat with 
uh, this group chat is pure shenanigans. Uh, there's no purpose to it whatsoever. Uh, fantasy sports, uh, the latest memes, videos, news. I mean, like there, there's no value added to anyone's life from this group chat except pure nonsense. And, and one guy reaches out to me in the group chat. He says, hey, I don't, I don't know if you know about our friend, but last week we were on a trip. He had three panic attacks. And one put him in the hospital. You may want to check on him. I called him. I said, bro, what? You're in the group chat talking about the latest movie? Like, what are you doing? What are we actually talking? What could have possibly been so important in that group chat that we actually failed to talk about what was actually important? My friends, I don't. I don't want us to have common courtesy. I want us to show uncommon care. How you doing? Good. Okay, let's try this one more time. How you really doing? I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. I, I don't want to have normal conversations. I, I want to have the kind of conversations that are described in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Oh, let your conversations mean something. Let your conversations have some substance to them. Have you ever just paused and taken inventory of the conversations that you've had over the last week? What are we talking about? Fantasy football, the weather, politics, taxes. I mean, just imagine if you and I just decided to be incredibly intentional in our conversations because if you want to know what absolutely breaks my heart the most is when a friend calls me and tells me they're getting divorced. And I, I always respond, bro, I, I didn't know you guys were having problems. And the reason I typically didn't know is because I typically didn't ask. But yet I was asking them questions about where they got their shoes from because that matters. Does it? Saddleback Church, how you doing? Good. In the event that your armor breaks and your church smile fades, I pray that in that moment you have a friend that you can call on, that you can be honest with. We all need a friend that it's okay not to be okay with. To be able to say, I'm overwhelmed and our marriage isn't good right now. To be able to, to admit that I'm struggling with parenthood. To be able to confess that my confidence has been shaken and I don't recognize myself sometimes to be able to say out loud that I've been feeling lonely and lost connection with friends. To be able to say I'm in a dark place and I'm having trouble finding the light. To be able to out loud in an audience that when I ask how you doing, for somebody to have the boldness to say, I don't know. Why? Because that's honest. And we're so glad that you decided to bring your I don't know to the house of God. And my hope and prayer is that this weekend you might be able to find a friend, a small group that you can plug in and go, I don't know, but I need some people to be around me. I know what 1 Samuel 23 says about a guy named David. It says, while David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life and, and Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horsh and helped him find strength in God. Uh, if you don't know anything about David in Scripture, at one point in his life, he was a fugitive on the run from a king. But he had a friend named Jonathan, who the Scripture shows us that he found David and he helped him find strength in God. I mean, it sounds really nice, right, that when you are facing your darkest day, what if you had a super friend on speed dial? Like that, he was in your favor, so you could just hit it, 
And bam, they were there to save the day. Here's what I'm going to encourage each and every one of us to do this week. Don't just look for the friend. Be the friend. Be the friend who helps their friends find strength in God when they need it the most. Be the friend who others cannot be okay with. Be the friend who can listen without judgment. Be the friend who puts zero pressure on their friends to have it all together. And I believe that if you and I make the decision to be that kind of friend long enough, I believe that we will reap what we sow. Secondly, I believe we all need honest friendships where we can be called out. Honest friendships where we can be called out. King David had a great friend in Jonathan, but what he lacked when he became king that I believe he needed the most was accountability. What he needed was someone in his life who could care less about his royalty. Someone that he would give permission to be a truth teller. I love what 2 Samuel 11, 1 tells us. It says, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Right away we can see David isn't where he's supposed to be. Verse 2 says, one evening, uh, David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba. I just find it ironic that the woman taking a bath's name is Bathsheba. Call me crazy. But anyways, uh, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. David, mostly known for being a giant slayer, is in the wrong place at the wrong time and is now sleeping with another man's wife. However, it doesn't stop there. David goes on to have her husband murdered. Uh, I love what one of my friends, who's a truth teller in my life, we were talking about this passage and he said something I'll never forget. He said, Ryan, Nobody goes to the roof thinking what happens on the roof is going to lead to murder. But that's sometimes how that cookie crumbles. And in the next chapter of David's life, uh, 2 Samuel 12 tells us that the Lord sent Nathan, who's a prophet, to David. And when Nathan approaches David, he begins to tell a story and paint a scene for David that basically goes like this. Um, there's this town with two guys, one rich, one poor. One's absolutely loaded with sheep and cattle. The poor guy has one little lamb that he treasures with all of his heart. Then a traveler comes by the rich guy's house, and instead of offering some of the sheep and cattle that he has so much of, he takes it from the poor guy and makes it for dinner. Wild, right? David hears this story, and this is what the scripture says is his response. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. David is livid over a story that is fiction. He's upset. He goes, whoever this guy is, he's got to go. He must die. He must pay for what he has done. And then Nathan, he, he reveals something about the story that David didn't see coming. Here, here's what Nathan said. He says, hey, David, you're the man. Yeah, yeah you're, you're the guy. 
David couldn't see a blind spot. He couldn't see that he was the man that had so much and yet took a wife and took a life away from an innocent man. And it took God sending Nathan to him for him to realize he was the man. Saddleback Church, I'm not saying you're the man. I'm not saying you're the person. I am saying you could be. And if you were the one who was in the wrong, who in your life has the permission to tell you that you're out of bounds? Who have you given permission to call you out? Can you imagine if David had Nathan one chapter earlier? Now, I've had the opportunity to uh, visit David's palace in Jerusalem that is still being ex excavated to this day. But you can see a, a little balcony in, in, in Jerusalem where you can actually see all of the roofs in town. It makes sense how my man could see somebody bathing. Why are you bathing? This is my palace. You happen to be outside taking a bath. That ain't on me. That's on you. So I understand how he got in the position. And one could make the argument that David, he can't help who's taking a bath when he's on the roof. But the moment he actually loses, it's not when he went to the roof. It's when the scripture tells us that David sent someone to find out about her. Now, he's on her Instagram profile and he's looking at, she ain't private, and, and he's just, he's scrolling, he's curious. He goes, hey, can you go find out about this girl? And, and David's primary issue in that moment is the someone he sent to find out about her didn't have the permission to tell him no. Didn't have the permission to say, hey, David, uh, that's probably a bad idea. Let's not. No, I'm not going to go find out about anybody. You and I desperately need a friendship where we can look each other in the eye and have the permission to say, hey, you're wrong. Hey, you're kind of being a jerk right now. Hey, your sarcasm is a defense mechanism from actually dealing with real issues. We only pretend to laugh because we don't know what our other options are. You gotta have a friend in your life that can tell you, hey, we, we walk on eggshells when you walk in the room. Your anger's out of control. You gotta have a friend in your life that can tell you you're not even trying hard. Or maybe you need to slow down. Or maybe you need to speed it up, you lazy bum. Like you need somebody in your life that can tell you the truth. Again, I'm not saying you're in the wrong or that you're out of bounds in some area of your life. But I am wondering, if you were, would you have anybody to let? You know, I've, I've had my fair share of friends and truth tellers in my life tell me things that my ego didn't want to hear. I had a friend the other day, just a couple of weeks ago, say, hey, Ryan, I understand what you're saying, but you know, you're, you're coming across pretty judgmental right now. I share my opinion on something I actually had very little experience with. And guess what? He was right. And I was wrong. I have a, an eight-year-old that you saw earlier that I have a very fun relationship with. He plays basketball, and so did I, and so... I think I take his games way more serious than he does, and that's fine, but oftentimes, oh, we have basketball banter that goes back and forth, and one day I was on the phone with my best friend, and for some reason or another, I made a sarcastic comment to my son along the lines of, I don't remember the exact details, so bear with me, okay, but it was something in the realm of, you're spoiled, you're fine, and then I continued on the phone with my friend. Now, him being spoiled, is the truth. He needs a truth teller. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean I should have said it. Do you understand? And I asked that friend a couple of weeks later, I said, hey man, are there any blind spots, any areas that you think I could grow in? And, and you know what he brought up? He brought up that moment. He brought up that, well, Ryan, you know the other day I was on the phone with you and you, 
You had that spoiled comment to your son. He goes, and I'm just, can I just submit something to you? Uh, you should be more intentional with your car rides because all I can tell you is this. In college, the most critical voice in my head was my father's voice. And it stemmed back to little comments like that. So if I were you, I would consider the words you want on repeat in his head 10 and 15 years from now. Now that wasn't easy to hear, but it changed my life and it changed my parenting. Car rides are different for my children and I now because I now see them as recordings instead of rides. And I just think, what track do I want them to play in the future? My friends, I think we all need a somebody that can be honest with us. And here's what I've learned. The somebody, the friend, doesn't have to be amazing. <laughs> no, they just have to be honest. They don't have to be the smartest person you know. But what is required for them to be a qualified candidate to call you out is simply permission. Permission to help us see what we cannot see on our own. Lastly, I believe we all need, number three, honest friendships where we can be called up. Honest friendships where we can be called up. Uh, there is a story in the book of Acts that I think is very powerful. Paul and a guy named Barnabas are in a city called Lystra where they see a man who has been disabled since birth. And Paul looks at the man and says, stand up on your feet. And the man immediately jumps up and begins to walk. What's interesting is the people in that city are in such shock that they shout, the gods have come down to us in human form. It got so crazy that the people threw a parade for them and brought a bull to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Paul tries to stop, stop this and said, people, you have lost your minds. We are not gods. However, we will tell you about the one true God. Their words didn't do much to stop the crowd from turning them in to gods. And, and here's what we see in Acts 14, verse 19. It says, then some Jews arrived from Antioch in Iconium and won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. Now, I don't know if you've ever been stoned, but I don't think we're talking about the same stoning, okay? Like stone, and we're talking rocks, okay? Just in case. I just want to be clear here at the church. Um, my, my guess is that the, the stoning he received, they thought he was dead. My guess is they checked his pulse, no pulse. I mean, that's how most of us come to a conclusion of thinking someone is dead. But verse 20 is where it gets good. Verse 20 says this. But as the believers, ooh, and the keys came in right on time for it to get real spiritual. That was perfect. Ooh, I loved it. That was perfect. But as the believers mm, 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 gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. Can you imagine this? Oh, he got up. This is better than Rocky. Left for dead. No pulse. The story should be over. Most people don't come back after being stoned, except Paul is the most people. And Paul had a group of believers that surrounded him, and he got back up. I can't imagine being stoned from my face and being left for dead, but I can't imagine what it would look like to be surrounded by a community of believers that have a little bit of faith and enough faith to call on God on my behalf to help me get back up. And I often wonder, what was Paul thinking? But it doesn't matter. He ain't had no pulse anyways. In this story, it only mattered what his friends were thinking. His friends were thinking, we are not going to let you die. We are not going to let you give up. And then they prayed like their lives depended on it. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us 
their conversation when all of this went on. But we must understand, he got back up. And then the best part is, he went back into the town. I just want you to visualize this. Imagine jumping somebody, leaving them for dead, and all of a sudden they walk back into the city and say, I'm back. How'd you get here? Oh, I, I, I got some friends that will not let me give up on my calling and what God has called me to do. So yes, I got back up because I am surrounded by the right people. Now for me, I'm a pretty logical guy. When I read this story, I think, well, how would it be if I was there? Because if one of my friends was left for dead, no pulse, and I prayed for this person to get back up, they get up, I hug them, I go, man, we almost lost you. Thank God I was here to save you, man. Goodness gracious, I'm so glad I could resurrect you from this stone. And lucky you, Paul. Nah, that ain't Paul. And that ain't these friends. I don't know what they said to Paul. But whatever they said, gave him the strength to go back into the town where he had just been stoned. He had some friends that said, I am not going to let you give up on what God has called you to do. And my prayer for us this weekend is that we would have the same thing. I had a friend. whose brother he didn't hear from for 36 hours, and he went to his brother's house, and he found his brother dead on the floor, and four feet from his brother's arms was his inhaler. He had an asthma attack and, and died on the spot, and, they, and my friends called me, and they said, Ryan, you got to get to Mike. You got to get to Mike. He, he's not answering the phone. We're worried about Mike. And I said, I'm, I got to go get Mike. So I go to Mike's house, and it's trash everywhere. And I just, he's laying in bed. And I, and I just sat at the edge of the bed, and I said, Mike, it's your boy. Today's a tough day but I gotta get you up. Have you eaten? He said, no, I, I don't even know if I can eat. I said, well, we gotta try. I said, Mike, I'm gonna help you get dressed. And we're going to Panda Express. <laughs> and he gets dressed and we go to Panda Express and he had a, and he had a few bites. Mike, Mike isn't a churchgoer. He texted me a couple weeks ago. He goes, thanks for always inviting me to church, man. He goes, you've always been in my corner. And I just, I just appreciate it. Then Mike sent me a video of this motivational speaker going, you need somebody in your life that'll come get you. And he said, Ryan, you're my guy. And I will never forget the day that you came and got me. And here's the deal, I know that you might be here today, you go, man, I wish I had a friend that could come and get me. Guess what? Can I be your friend for a weekend? Hi, my name is Ryan, and I flew from Texas to come and get you. Because sometimes you can believe a lie. Sometimes you can believe that you're not enough. Sometimes you can believe that you are a failure. Sometimes you can believe that you are always going to be depressed. Sometimes you believe that your marriage is never going to turn around or that you're too young or you're too old to change and that it's just too late for you. But I want to be your friend for a weekend. And can I be a truth teller? Can I remind you that God has an incredible purpose for your life, that he's gifted you? That Ephesians 2.10 tells us that God had a plan, a good work for you to do long before you were born. Can I remind you that 2 Peter first verses chapter 1 verse 3 says, His divine power has given you everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Can I remind you that there's a lot that you can't do? 
but with Jesus on your side, the possibilities are endless. Oh, can I be your friend for a minute and remind you of the truth that you can change. Despite what you've been told, you are not too young. You can turn things around. You will not always be depressed. You are not a failure. And what God has put on the inside of you can add tremendous value to the world around you. You don't have to settle for less. You might feel weak. That's when God's strength becomes perfect in the middle of our weakness. What would you do if I told you that God is just getting warmed up with what he wants to do with your life? Don't believe the lie. It'd be awesome if you and I had super friends where we could be called on, called out, and sometimes called up. But I have to encourage each and every one of us again not to just look for the friend, but to be the friend. Oh, be that friend that helps people get back up, that helps friends turn things around. Be that friend that helps people face cancer and anxiety and failure. Be the friend that reminds people of the truth. You may be joining us today thinking, I wish I had a circle like that. And I just want you to know it's possible. I want to give you a next step today that I think could change your life. I want to give you an opportunity to join a community of people that you could have a chance at truly having honest friendships. There's a QR code here that you can scan, and what you'll find is an opportunity to click on a link and join a small group. Now, if you're introverted, this might be terrifying. I get it. I know sometimes people can be weird. I know that it, that's even scarier when you're talking about weird extroverted people hanging out with introverted quiet. I get it. Maybe you tried a small group before and the food wasn't very good or the animals was acting a fool. It smelled. You just, ah, it's just not for you. I, 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 I get it. But can I encourage you this weekend to pray? Even if you're not a Christian, would you, it's amazing. Did you know even when you're not a Christian, God still takes your phone call? So would you just ask, well, Lord, is, could it be that there is a small group of people that you designed for me and you designed me for them? I think that's true for all of us here today. And I get it. Maybe, maybe your last experience wasn't great. And, and if the food wasn't good, maybe God's calling you to bring better food. Think about that for a minute. I don't know, but... I, but I want you to scan this QR code. And you'll actually be able to find a list of small groups where you can literally go small group shopping. How about that, okay? I want you to go small group shopping. And, and in your small group, whether it's a formal saddleback small group or maybe it's an informal one that you have with a group of friends, here's what I encourage you to do this week. Be honest and be intentional. Maybe you need to ask a friend how they're really doing. Don't settle for common courtesy. Maybe you need to give some friends permission to help you see a blind spot. Maybe you need to ask a friend if they've got a lie that they've been believing lately. And then don't let the lie win. My prayer for each and every one of us is that we'd all leave here a little bit more intentional and a little bit more honest with our friendships. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about something that is near and dear to your heart, and that's relationships. God, I, I pray that each and every person joining us today would find themselves surrounded by a community of people where they can be honest, where they can use some words that are sometimes difficult to say out loud, where they can say, help me, please, and that they would be surrounded by some people that they could trust with that word. God, I pray that we would give somebody the permission in our life to be honest with us, to help us grow closer to you, and Lord, I pray that we would be surrounded by a group of people that on our darkest day, 
that they could surround us and help us get back up and stay on track with what you called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen.